Lumos. Oh, hey folks. Time once again for a Harry Potter list, and this time it's all about those little details you might have missed in the movies. From crazy credits to heartbreaking character moments, we've got them all. But we're only telling you like 25 of them, because like, I don't know, it's a lucky number, I guess. Anyway, let's do this thing. Incendio. A true blink and you miss it moment, Professor McGonagall's name can be seen next to James Potter's in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. While no position is listed, it's safe to assume her time on the Quidditch team has something to do with her fierce love of the sport. I bet she was hell in a broom too. Dame Maggie Smith, she don't take no guff, y'all. Another small detail from that scene, James Potter's position is listed on the trophy as Seeker. J.K. Rowling has stated that James was a chaser when he was on the team, so this could just be a production error, or maybe James played both positions at some point, or heck, maybe there's some wild tale of a trophy shop down in Hogsmeade, messing up the inscription for Hogwarts whilst battling some sort of epic magical uh, trophy thing with teeth or something. Look, I'm just saying, when that winds up in a Fantastic Beasts sequel, you won't think I'm nearly as crazy as you do right now. Also in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Neville receives a remember-all via owl post. Hey look, Neville's got a remember-all. While Hermione is explaining how the device works, it fills with red smoke, indicating that Neville has forgotten something. He doesn't remember what he forgot, but observant fans can deduce that he forgot his robes, as he's the only student not wearing them. Now, if you've watched a movie with animals in it made within the last few decades, you'll be used to seeing no animals were harmed in the making of this film. I mean, if you, you know, watch the credits, which you should, there's a lot of like artists and stuff who are in there and, you know, you can like pick out all those fun names who worked in the CGI team and stuff. Anyway, the team who put together Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire's credits had a little fun with this, saying no dragons were harmed in the making of this movie, a none too subtle reference to the highly memorable dragon-based action Harry has to contend with as part of the Triwizard Tournament. In Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Aunt Petunia can be seen dying something in the kitchen when Harry gets his letter. Fans of the books can piece together that she's dying Dudley's old clothes for Harry to wear to Stonewall High, where the Dursleys were going to send him before they were convinced to send Harry to Hogwarts. Ah, child abusers and cheapskates. <laughs> those wacky Dursleys. Harry's scar burns for the first time in the Great Hall when Professor Snape glances at him in Sorcerer's Stone. If fans are able to take their eyes off the late great Alan Rickman, which admittedly pretty tough to do since he basically had a charisma-based magnet for a face, they'll notice that Professor Quarrel has his back to Harry, and therefore the weird tumor that is Voldemort is facing our hero thereby causing the burning. This is one of the more obvious on our list, but here goes. In Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry lands himself permanently on Lucius Malfoy's bad side when he tricks him into freeing Dobby the house elf uh, with the use of a sock. In a fit of rage, Malfoy Sr. points his wand at Harry and starts to say a spell before being interrupted by Dobby who totally just, just whoops Lucius's ass. Oh my God, it's so great to watch. Oh, casual viewers unfamiliar with the later books may not recognize the curse, but loyal readers could recognize Avada as being the first of two words for the killing curse. It's a shame for Malfoy. Had he been successful, he would have won quite a bit of favor with, uh, well, you know who. One of the handier magical artifacts is Molly Weasley's clock showing the location of each member of her family. While viewers may have been focused on watching the Weasley children's clock hands move to the home position, observant fans could see that prison and dentist are the other options. We like to think that dentist was added strictly for the amusement of Arthur Weasley, as dentists aren't exactly commonplace in the wizarding world. Speaking of dentists, let's talk breakfast cereal. It's um, it's bad for your teeth because because of all the sugar. Unless you're like eating like I don't know keto cereal. Look, this segue sucks. Anyway, in Order of the Phoenix, there's a box of cereal in the Great Hall called Cheery Owls. Of course, referencing Cheerios and um, 
owls, which wizards like because they don't understand email. Look, they can't all be winners, folks. Cheery owls, nutritious and delicious for all those growing young wizards out there. And presumably without the drawbacks of Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans, presumably. I, th I think I've milked this one for all it's worth. <laughs> also in Order of the Phoenix, Mr. Weasley takes Harry to the Ministry for his hearing. In order to access the entrance, Mr. Weasley puts in some money and quickly dials 62442. This actually spells out M-A-G-I-C, magic, on a telephone's number pad. Not the most secure password in the world, especially for someone so obsessed with muggle technology, but what are you gonna do? Ugh, I can't imagine how many times his Hotmail account's been hacked. There's a very fun little detail in Chamber of Secrets that helps highlight how much of a fraud Lockhart is. His whole shtick is that he pretends to be this great wizard with books and everything, but in reality, he's just shy of completely useless. So sorry, dozed off. What have I missed? A girl has been snatched by the monster Lockhart. Your moment has come at last. If you look closely in his office, you'll notice a blonde wig on his desk, implying that not even the hair on his head is legitimate. Dude's a class act through and through, in that he's acting like he has any class. hey -o. Ha ha! Ah, that's terrible. Professor Slughorn is a delightful character added relatively late into the series, and while he's talented in many aspects of his life, he could use a little practice with transfiguration. Overall, his chair disguise was fairly convincing. Four out of five, I like it. Though one could argue that the shoes sticking out of the bottom were a dead giveaway. I guess you could argue that slippers under a chair wasn't too big of a giveaway though, especially since Dumbledore was actually clued in by the use of dragon's blood, but either way, it's a cute touch to clue fans in to the professor's comfy disguise. If you're not familiar with Victorian era flower symbolism, first off, get with it, it's the new cool, like just trust me on this. You may have missed Snape's coded message to Harry in Sorcerer's Stone. One of the questions Snape asks is if Harry knows what would result in adding the powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood. Harry doesn't know the answer, but that's not the important part. Asphodel is a lily, which means demise under the Victorian flower code, while wormwood reflects loss and absence. Of course, Snape was in love with Harry's mother, Lily, going so far as to ask Voldemort to spare her, which of course doesn't happen, to his great regret. The romanticizing of this relationship is pretty gross, and Snape's obsession with Lily is definitely nothing to cheer for, but still, it is a sad state of affairs, especially in how the film portrays it and Snape's final downfall. And this moment helps to bolster that early on without us even noticing at the time. Is this just fans reading too much into a scene? Yeah, probably, but it's still a fun little tidbit, and hey, if it wasn't for needlessly reading too far into notable mainstream properties, I wouldn't have a job. Keep it up, Potterheads. Over to Deathly Hollows Part 2. It's a very quick moment, but when Harry surprises everyone by being alive, you see George turn and start to say something starting with F before the scene cuts. It's fairly safe to assume he was turning to his own twin to share the excitement of their friend and, well, hope being alive. But Fred wasn't there because he was dead, which, uh, yeah, really adds a thin veil of dour to the scene. Here's a fact that only had a brief mention in the books and basically zero screen time. Molly Weasley had twin brothers named Gideon and Fabian Pruitt, who died in the first Wizarding War. In the book Order of the Phoenix, Mad-Eye Moody tells Harry that it took five Death Eaters to take down the brothers. On Harry's 17th birthday, Molly actually gives Harry Fabian's watch as watches are traditional 17th birthday gifts. The movies just have them appear in a photograph and are never mentioned by name. Of course, Molly also has twin sons whose names start with F and G, but in the latest Wizarding War, only one is killed, making it a sort of half a repetition or a something. Uh, look, I just wanted to share this fun fact, all right? I mean, I realize it's not it's not fun. It's, it's actually kind of sad, but hey, get off my back. Speaking of aggressively depressing, the Harry Potter film franchise does get noticeably darker as it goes on, both in their cinematography and their content. Oh, 
and their studio logos. If you pay attention to the opening Warner Brothers logos, the first film starts with the standard issue bright, happy-go-lucky, totally chill version. And as we continue, it just gets darker and darker and darker. Presumably one more movie, and we would have just gotten a black screen. Speaking of the Warner Brothers logos and how they tie into the films, at the very beginning of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, if you look closely, you'll see Voldemort's pet snake and future poorly thought out prequel human character Nagini reflected in the Warner Brothers logo. It's like a hidden Mickey, but um, a snake. Hey, want to see a magic trick? Floop. There goes that bottle. This is one of those little world building details in Prisoner of Azkaban that just gets me all giddy. Mostly because I used to wait tables for a living and let me tell you, this is a bit of magic I really could have used back in the day. It's also a very clever way to handle something fairly innocuous with movie magic so people like me can point it out in YouTube videos. Thanks, movie! In Sorcerer's Stone, the way that the trio wear their scarves is very in line with their personalities. Hermione's is neat and tidy as she is always fastidious and rule-abiding. Harry's is casually draped across his neck and over one shoulder, showing a more relaxed view of the rules and life in general. And Ron's is just hanging open, presumably offering zero warmth because Ron is chill AF. <laughs> the Leaky Cauldron serves as the gateway into Diagon Alley from Muggle London. It probably wouldn't be good for there to be a pub with a wizards come here and drink and stuff sign, so the Leaky Cauldron uses magic to only show itself to wizards, or to folks familiar with it, I, I would assume. Otherwise, how would Hermione Granger's parents shop with her? In Sorcerer's Stone, as Hagrid and Harry are walking in, the sign fades from black to the actual sign for the pub. Neat! When Harry Potter ventures into Tom Riddle's memories in Chamber of Secrets, the scenes are in black and white. Harry, who wasn't actually present when the memories were, um, memoried, is shown in the same light as he was writing in the diary in front of the fireplace. This is one of those Pleasantville-esque special effects that must have required a great deal of attention and more than a few bucks to pull off, and chances are a lot of you didn't even notice. Now that's dedication to the craft. Lucius Malfoy earned himself a trip to Azkaban for his involvement in the battle at the Ministry in Order of the Phoenix, which, you know, sucks, but maybe try not being part of an evil cult, you doink. In Deathly Hollows, part uh, the second one, you can spot Azkaban numbers tattooed on the side of his neck after Draco gets his awkward hug from Voldemort. More solid attention to detail from the Potter crew. Prisoner of Azkaban introduced us to the fan favorite Marauders. While non-book reading fans may not have noticed this, folks familiar with the novels may notice that Mooney is spelled M-O-O-N-E-Y on the map in the movie. No, it's not an error. Rather, this was a nod to the movie's visual effects supervisor, Carl Mooney. He had also worked on the great British comedy series Red Dwarf, Lara Croft Tomb Raider, and of course, the greatest animal-based sequel of all time, and the second best sequel in George Miller's career, Babe, Pig in the City. Also in Prisoner of Azkaban, if you look closely at the Marauders map, the order of names is presented as Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, Prongs. This is the inverse of their in-book death order, wherein they go Prongs, Padfoot, Wormtail, Mooney. Although the movies don't actually show Wormtail, aka Peter Pettigrew's death. He's last seen being stunned in Deathly Hollows, although it is possible he's killed and it's simply left ambiguous. Either way, it's far less definitive than in the books, where he's strangled by his own enchanted hand. Which would have been a pretty metal way to go out, honestly. And finally, in Deathly Hollows Part 1, Dan Radcliffe got naked and they put the poster in a cafe. Okay, that's simplifying it a bit. Basically, there's this little rather notorious play about violence against horses called Equus, which I actually read in college and quite enjoyed and wished I had the body for it. And Daniel Radcliffe, in the midst of Pottermania, starred in a 2007 West End revival of the play, which notably requires some nudity for his part of Alan Strang. Radcliffe was only 17 at the time, which raised some hackles, but he insisted that it was necessary to follow the play to the letter. Needless to say, tickets sold well among the fanbase. In Deathly Hollows, this poster for the play adorns the wall as a subtle nod to a not-so-subtle moment for the young actor. 
Okay, and uh, yeah, that's it. There's so many fun details in the Harry Potter series. We might as well pop in one, one last little Easter egg. Draco Malfoy's wife at the end of Deathly Hollows Part 2, uh, when they're all grown up, that was Tom Felton's actual girlfriend, stunt assistant Jade Olivia. They eventually broke up, which, um, awkward. 